Now we have the Congressional Confessional. Let me introduce Dan Spooler, who is leading up the Blockchain Association uh, delegation to DeFiCon. So take it away, Dan. Thanks so much. Uh, great to see everybody here. This is my second one. I was at the uh, DeFi Con back in uh, December, so was Francesco. Um, and today we're going to have an exciting panel. Um, in August is typically the slow month in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill. So uh, although this year and last year were quite different. Um, but we're glad to have some distinguished panelists with us today. Uh, they took the Excel train up uh, just for this. And I think we're going to cover some interesting topics today. So before we get started, I just want to also just comment that um, there's been dozens of bills that have been introduced or proposed over the last uh, few years in the digital asset space. And uh, our panelists today actually have been intricately involved in a lot of those. So we're going to get down to uh, a discussion. And I'll let our panelists uh, introduce themselves and their, uh, the member they work for. Want to get started? How's it going, everybody? Good to see you all again and uh, happy to be back. And uh, my name is Francesco Costella. I work for Congressman uh, Ted Budd from, from North Carolina. Uh, he serves on the Financial Services Committee in the House. Um, and you know, primarily, I'm a, his fin a senior policy advisor, handling his financial services portfolio, specifically doing a lot on the digital assets uh, uh, issues. Um, and I'm you know, happy to be back. Hey, guys. My name is Saruthi. Uh, I work for Congressman Trey Hollingsworth, who also sits on the Financial Services Committee. Um, I handle his full financial services portfolio, um, which a good portion of that is his uh, digital as assets work as well. Hi, everyone. My name is Lizzie Fallon. I am Congressman Emmer's financial services policy advisor. He also sits on the financial services committee. He's the lead Republican for the oversight subcommittee, uh, and he's mainly focused on regulatory clarity, oversight, and fintech crypto. So it's good to be here. Hey, y'all. My name is Ron Hammond. I'm with the uh, Blockchain Association with uh, Dan Spoiler as well. Uh, I am the uh, more Republican lobbyist for the association based here in D.C. Uh, but beforehand, I actually used to work on Capitol Hill. Uh, very similar to these roles here, I used to work for Representative Warren Davidson from Ohio, uh, focusing on crypto policy most of the time. So excited to be here. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I want to do a little bit of uh, a uh, step back. Just one year ago, I can't believe it's been exactly one year. Uh, last August, we were in the middle of uh, the, the infrastructure bill debates that really uh, got the attention of the nation. And um, it's, I can't believe it's already been 12 months. And I'm curious for the panel, um, what have we seen over the last 12 months regarding this infrastructure bill? Uh, and has it been enacted? Is there rulemaking going on? I mean, how is it affecting where we're currently at in the space? Who wants to take a stab at that? I'm happy to go first uh, since we're more on the lobbying side here, but I'd love to hear from, uh, from y'all as well as being more on the Hill staff side as well. But um, yes, yeah, so for those who may or not, may not remember, uh, literally this time last year, the infrastructure bill, uh, major uh, initiative by the Biden administration, and you know, several trillion dollars were at play here. And one of the pay fors that they had for the uh, infrastructure bill was a crypto reporting requirement. Uh, and the idea was that basically we wanted to have all the exchanges uh, give 1099s to uh, those uh, who are utilizing their services to make sure that we can report taxes uh, fairly and such. However, the definition was so broad of what a broker is that it could encapsulate the entire industry, DeFi, mining, and so much more. And so that was really concerning uh, when folks can't even collect that information because they don't even have access to it. So, um, so that was a huge deal. Uh, but since then, that was pretty much the, the bellwether of like, all the lobbying efforts that have really you know, it's ramped up. I mean, I imagine you guys are probably seeing that significantly increase the past year. Um, but you know, I'd love to get you all thoughts on just how the lobbying space, the advocacy space on crypto has really evolved since the infrastructure bill in these past 12 months. Yeah, I can jump in here. Uh, on the flip side, um, yeah, since since August of 21, we saw, because of the great advocacy efforts, um, a, a lot more interest in crypto policy. And we saw that through the Blockchain Caucus, which my boss helps run. It's a nonpartisan group of members that just care about crypto policy. It's been around for a long time, too. But anyways, we grew, we doubled our size in 2021 because so many members cared about that. We opened up our educational events and meetings to everyone on the Hill doesn't matter if your boss is part of the caucus or not. doesn't matter if you're on the House side or not. And we saw a ton of people from the Senate side listening in and just getting up to speed. So it was, it was a really influential, kind of bittersweet moment because it sucked that that is now law. Um, but there's a lot more people and a lot more hands on, uh, on deck trying to, trying to fix it. So. Yeah, I think uh, going back to a little bit of looking at the infrastructure bill that passed, 
Um, that's really when we saw the industry kind of come into its own in terms of getting its own voice and finding its power. Um, I know many of us can probably attest to uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, influxes of, of calls, messages, emails, et cetera, that, that we were getting on this issue. And uh, it's, it's kind of funny um, to think that like, you had, in this large, massive infrastructure package, crypto became like the number one topic of discussion that no one thought of because of this one provision. Um, I know our office was leading a fight um, on trying to push for adoption in, of one of the uh, one of the original amendments to fix that language. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, it looks like it, you know that that kind of went to not because of some unrelated issues that, that killed it. But I think all of us ended up joining a uh, a McHenry bill that would uh, take that that amendment that fixed the language, that tailored it, brought it back into. Uh, a, a better scope, and uh, we, we you know, all co-sponsored that as well to try to get that adopted and, and fixed. Um, so it's still an issue going on because it got signed into law. So now it's trying to fix that that individual provision. Lizzie, a few seconds ago, you had mentioned the Congressional Blockchain Caucus, and um, I've been following that pretty closely over the years. It's grown considerably. Um, can you explain that a little bit more for the audience and what what, what their mandate is, and and is it bipartisan? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's pretty equal, Republicans, Democrat. It's, uh, it was founded in 2014 by Jared Polis, a Democrat from Colorado, and Mick Mulvaney, and uh, and and since then it's grown tremendously. My boss joined in 2015. He became a co-chair in, in I think 2018, um, and we've got about 40 members now who are committed to a common sense approach to a light touch common sense approach to to um, crypto regulation. So it's been an educational vehicle up until I would say probably through August and, and, and today it's still an educational vehicle um, because that's the most important thing right now but we're working to mobilize into more of a policy vehicle so we can get to a place where all the members are on board to push certain policy provisions or to block them like the Portman Amendment and the infrastructure bill. So it's been a really great tool. It's, it's cool to see the interest and the engagement from the crypto community um, to utilize the caucus as a vehicle Vehicle. Um, and I think it's really become a trusted institution in Congress for uh, uh, for perspectives on this because the, the co-chairship and the leadership of the caucus spans the political spectrum. We have uh, we have leaders from the progressive caucus, from the freedom caucus to moderates in between like my boss and Darren Soto uh, who all agree on an approach to legislating and regulating this space and it's a really common sense industry vetted and supported approach. Um, and and so I, I feel like it's become a group that, you know, members who maybe are new to this can go and find one of those, you know, leaders of the caucus uh, for for a trusted perspective. Ron, do you uh, work with the Blockchain Caucus pretty closely uh, in your position at the BA? Um, I know you cover one side of the aisle, but um, how valuable is that as an entity to what you do? The Blockchain Caucus has been fantastic. Uh, so on Capitol Hill, it's a great way to educate a lot of staffers and members of Congress across the political spectrum uh, on all things crypto. Uh, you know, we actually had some DeFi presentations, Web3. Uh, you know, we were focusing on stable coins a lot recently. So it's been really exciting just the range of gam the gamut of issues in the crypto space and how much it's really evolved. And so, uh, and I think the most important thing with the Blockchain Caucus is just the, the grounded roots that this is a bipartisan issue. And that's something that we want to make sure we keep having this uh, in this space that is a bipartisan issue uh, because the second that becomes, you know, one party versus the other, we're subject to the political whims and that's just no way to regulate an industry. We want to make sure that we have both sides of the aisle uh, in which we do. Uh, and if there's any, you know, difference right now of opinion between members of Congress, it's mostly along the generational lines. You know, we're seeing a lot more of the younger folks uh, in Congress on both sides of the aisle on all across the spectrum really get involved in this issue. So uh, to see, you know, Lizzie, Sruthi, uh, and Francesco really lean this on the staff level for the caucus, but also for their individual bosses is really exciting. So, um, you know, we're expanding so much. I mean, Lizzie's mentioning the, the, the growth has been incredible. So it's been hugely helpful for the education and uh, looking forward to more coming up. Yeah, and no, we may be getting some more members uh, possibly after the election this fall. So we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. Um, one of the issues that, I mean, there's a lot of issues I certainly want to cover today, but this one particularly is relevant, I think, to the DeFi space, and that's stable coins. Um, Sruthi, you've been very active in that from the office of Hollingsworth. Um, it, there's been the Coins Act recently. There's been the Stablecoin Transparency Act uh, earlier this year. Uh, and everybody can weigh in on this, but I wanted to start with you just to see um, where are we at with stablecoin legislation uh, in the United States. Sure. Thanks for uh, that question. Um, 
So we have been working on a couple pieces of legislation because um, my boss was really focused uh, and kind of viewed the conversation around fiat currency backed stable coins is kind of how we have the term we've been using and um, the reserves that um, back those coins in um, trying to uh, provide some regulatory clarity for um, to ensure that we there's transparency around what reserves are held and that we're holding high uh, quality reserves. Um, and so our first legislation uh, we worked on, um, quite frankly, one of the biggest challenges that we have right now as uh, legislators is that there's not really existing definitions out there. So we're kind of creating these definitions into law as we're kind of uh, trying to discern what's the best way to do that. So um, we first kind of put guardrails around what, how do we even define these certain kind of stable coins beyond currency backed. And then we um, try to address some of the concerns we've heard from those, uh, that we've seen from those stable coins as far as ensuring or requiring issuers to um, disclose what kind of reserves they uh, hold so that we can provide more stability and there's more credibility um, behind those stable coins. And also um, beyond that, create that distinction right now in the conversation with our second bill and um, clarify that these fiat currency backed stable coins that we're defining are not a uh, security or commodity. They shouldn't get lumped in with kind of the larger conversations that's coming out of the SEC and um, with their broader reach. Um, and so that's been our kind of main area of focus and we've been trying to take it as somewhat of a um, incremental approach because this is such a pressing issue we uh, see and we want to make sure that while there may not be agreement um, on every single aspect of these issues, um, we should find areas that we can already agree on and there is that bipartisan, bicameral support um, and make progress there um, so that even if it's may not be the comprehensive packages that we can get passed immediately, but at least we're taking step by step. So. Anybody else want to weigh in on stable coins? I know that's a hot topic. Yeah, actually, I'd love to get, uh, Frank, I'd love to get your thoughts too, actually. Um, you know, there have been so many crashes that have been happening recently and so many token failures. Uh, but, you know, at least when we're talking about stable coins, Terra, um, you know, for those who may not know in D.C., uh, about situated about a half a mile from the Capitol is National Stadium, the baseball team. And Terra did this huge ad buy. And so there's Terra ads, even though they're defunct, Terra is everywhere plastered all over. And let alone three weeks ago, the members of Congress all play a baseball game together, Republicans versus Democrats. And in the outfield, you can still see, and in the in infield as well, Terra plastered everywhere. So while we were talking about stable coin regulation uh, and legislation, there's, and looming in the back of them, literally, uh, is the word Terra. So Frank, at least, what was Capitol Hill's reaction to Terra in your experience, uh, and many of the offices that you were talking to about the issue? And Sruthi and Lizzie, love to get girls' thoughts too. <laughs> I think the main reaction was, what's, what's an algo? What's an algorithmic stable coin? <laughs> um, like, our offices have been dealing with this a lot, so we got it, but there, there was a huge, I think, education. I mean, any topic of crypto, there's going to be a massive curve that we have to deal with, an educational upheaval. Um, but that was a big one, right? That was, <laughs> that was unfortunate because as we were in the middle of doing this fiat-backed stable coin bill, um, the, the Terra Luna crash happened. So then that brought that to the forefront and members are like, whoa, what is this thing? This, this looks like a scam, we gotta deal with this. So that is now unfortunately kind of being lumped into this conversation as well. Um, I, you know, on a personal level, I think that the two things should be dealt with separately and they are not the same issue, um, but we'll see how things go along. But um, I think the Terra Luna uh, issue is just another example of how uh, education is a huge thing for, for members of Congress and just lawmakers and staff in terms of uh, helping members and staff understand what the difference is between the two or different assets, what they are, what's going on. I mean, even on a DeFi front, when, when the Celsius issue happened, I remember people being like, oh, look at DeFi. We're like, that's not, Celsius is centralized. That is like, okay, let's roll it back. Um, but that's, th these are things, we're tr points we're trying to make. I mean, uh, uh, in terms of creating clear, guidance, clear regulations, rules of the road that everybody wants and works for, you know, industry and promotes innovation. That's all we, that's what we want. That's what we're fighting for. You don't want to see uh, things being conflated or mixed in or, you know, you know, banned or, uh, you know, moratoriums placed because that's not very helpful. Uh, definitions are also extremely important. Uh, I think part of this conversation now with the, with the stablecoin bill is looking at uh, the definitions of what it means to be an algorithmic stablecoin, what it means to be a, a fiat backed or a payment stablecoin, um, and separating the two and being very clear about that. Uh, I know 
in terms of DeFi, like we, our, my office works, you know, my, and my boss is very deeply uh, ingrained on DeFi specific issues. And we understand that the, the, the two uh, important roles, algos and, and fiats play in, into that system. So ensuring that like we're not going out and just strictly banning them and we're being very thoughtful in the approach of how they are defined and how they are regulated in terms of allowing for clarity. So developers can go and still build and put forward great products and aren't afraid of you know, not being able to do anything or, or being pushed overseas. Yeah. Uh, that's all very important to us. Um, and that's what we want to see. So when we, when we push the negotiations, it's all about one, maintaining, maintaining the, the edge that we have, and that is allowing for innovation, allowing for freedom of speech, which is you know, our, my, my personal opinion, like I think code is freedom of speech and development, and that, that's a good thing that we have here in the States, uh, and that we should be promoting that, because that's the, you know, the edge that the United States has always had in terms of developing brand new products. So why, why should it be different now? So it sounds like there's a, at least a, an understanding of the differences between the different types of stable coins within at least the blockchain caucus, hopefully all of Congress. Um, and not all these stable coins are created equal, obviously. But Terra was probably not a very good example, but there's other algos out there that are doing interesting work. And um, so there's no ban on those, at least anytime soon, right? But there's nothing right now that bans or anything. There's, uh, there's no bans in place on, on anything um, uh, in that space. Uh, yeah. But... In, in general, I mean, like, you want to see ideas that are going to allow for development, right? You don't want to put forward ideas or legislation that, that prohibit that. Um, now, I think we would come from the assumption that there should be regulation in place that allow for uh, the creation of good algorithmic stable coins that adhere to good standards and are going to operate the way they should and are going to be, you know, work efficiently, aren't going to lead to what we saw with Terra and Luna. I think everybody would agree with that. I know we've heard from industry and they want to have, cl they want to have clarity. That's going to be beneficial for all and avoid situations like we saw here. But I think what we, what I get worried about is like when you have a situation like what happened with Luna and Terra, uh, that you, you have policymakers that kind of run to the opposite end and get freaked out and they want to immediately issue uh, a halt on production or like ban on, on development because that, they're, they're scared. So we want to you know, be like calm the fears, like hold on, let's have a thoughtful process about this. Let's think about what this is, what, we, what these things should look like, what they shouldn't. But at the end of the day, like we want to encourage innovation here. We want to encourage development in the United States. Yeah, just to piggyback off of Francesca there, I think, um, you're totally right. I mean, I think the most important part is, as far as, as we think through legislation, is we don't want to be legislating through knee-jerk reactions. Um, and a huge part of that is making sure that, uh, to your point earlier, that the education component is probably first and foremost. If uh, you'll see a lot of members of Congress, uh, it's getting better, I think, uh, with the great advocacy um, from the industry. But members of Congress uh, kind of use the cryptocurrency or digital assets umbrella and lump everybody in the ecosystem together. And so first and foremost, creating that distinction, um, but also being proactive by finding, prioritizing issues that we have to work on quickly um, and actually building a coalition to pass that, uh, pass legislation that addresses that so that we can take a tiered process to then address um, algorithmic stable coins and establish what's the right framework there and um, making sure that we are legislating with a light touch approach that fosters innovation. We want, and because of that, we want to be precise, not um, move too quickly. I completely agree with everything. And I think one thing um, that hopefully could provide a smidge of comfort in this chaos that we, we have going on right now is um, I think the fact that the pieces of legislation, the thoughtful pieces of legislation that are being proposed and considered right now are coming from members and groups of members that are educated on the issues. They're blockchain caucus members in the House. Um, so the, the substantive work that's being done on this uh, from the legislative standpoint and the bill tech standpoint um, is coming from, from, from members that for the most part are, are super up to speed. Um, so that I think is one silver lining in everything um, that that should give some hope. And, that, and that's just good to build on that. I mean, that goes to show the great rework that the Blockchain Caucus is doing and groups like Blockchain Association are doing to educate members and keep them in touch because this development is happening. And it's happening in a bipartisan way, which is great, right? There's, there's buy-in from everybody. 
Negotiations are very fluid and ongoing. That's something we want to see because at the end of the day, it's going to be a little bit good product. So uh, there's, there's great work going around all over the place, and then we want to see that continue. Yeah, and cri crypto is not partisan. Tech's not partisan. It's for everyone. So uh, the ethos of of the community is definitely um, being carried over into Congress at the at the legislative bill text level, and that makes me hopeful. You know, that brings me to my next question, actually. So senior policy advisors and former policy advisors. Um, you engage heavily with industry stakeholders. And how has that helped you uh, over the years in helping craft uh, favorable policies? I mean, does, when people come in and meet with you, does that help and is that effective? It's tremendously helpful, uh, especially for technology that's, uh, and for a community that's so new and technology that's so different. Like decentralized technology is just different from how you know, members have lived most of their lives, staff have lived most of their lives. Um, it's, it's so helpful and most, I mean, most of what I've learned has been on the job over the past couple of years. Um, and it's come from, you know, meetings and different educational events and stuff that the, the community works really, really hard to educate Congress. Um, you guys do an awesome job. Well, Ron, I know you co-authored or authored the Token Taxonomy Act a few years ago, one of the earliest pieces of legislation in this space. I mean, did you get industry feedback from that as you were crafting it? Yeah, industry feedback is crucial. You know, at least for, for those who may not be familiar with D.C., you know, members of Congress, are, they're, they're, we talk about education a lot here, why education is so important. we got to keep in mind that these members of Congress are covering every single issue underneath the game. But, you know, again, health care, technology, crypto, finance, I mean, all across immigration. So there's so many issues that they have to be, you know, spun up on. That's why staff are so important because they have the time to go into the weeds on these issues. And crypto is already complex enough of a topic, but, you know, to go even further into weeds, fully understand it, and to write legislation is a whole other thing. But here's a good thing, is that we are really getting close to the point that legislation is going to be passing. I mean, I think 2023, next Congress, when it starts in January, we're going to see some really monumental legislation um, not, you know, just get introduced. We should see in the past, again, like the bill that I uh, did for Representative Warren Davidson. We're actually going to see some of these bills move through Congress. We could see one big bill. We can see maybe smaller bills here and there. Uh, and a lot of that is being written by folks who are up here like this uh, and many more back in D.C., which is awesome. Um, and again, a lot of the members are engaged personally then too, but the staff are just as important, if not even more. So it's really uh, awesome to see this kind of come to the forefront. But um, you know, I know a lot of folks been here again, I think about introduction of legislation, but we're now seeing the movement of legislation. Um, and this is a really critical time. So it's really exciting. Uh, and it's been a long time coming now. No, I think Ron's absolutely right. Uh, everything we've seen building up to this moment is finally you know, paying off. Um, I personally am very bullish about the future of it, of crypto in general, and especially the outlook that, that Congress has had. Uh, um, I know we've all uh, probably shared the same frustration that you all have felt and the industry has felt with like the SEC and other certain regulators uh, and, their, and their reactions and uh, outlook on crypto, but um, Congress has been moving in the right direction. It just moves really slow, which is unfortunate, but that's just kind of the nature of it. Uh, but I think Ron is spot on with, you know, we're probably, we're, we're in a spot where we're going to start seeing actual legislation, good, very thoughtfully put together legislation that's going to benefit the industry in terms of the sense of giving them the clarity they need, start actually passing, uh, and setting down that foundation, that framework that we need. So, I mean, it's going to build one by one, uh, but we're, we're on the cusp of that. Yeah, and it's not even legislation, oversight, too, at the agencies. You mentioned the SEC. I mean, listen, your boss is um, the ranking member of the oversight subcommittee, which oversees the SEC. So, I mean, there's the uh, lead Republican for oversight of the SEC. It's your boss. Um, so how are you guys feeling either, you know, about the SEC now, at least that approach, and the oversight more capability uh, if the Republicans do take the majority? Well, yeah. I we're thinking the same thing because con Congress has two jobs. You had to legislate, but also to oversee. Legislating takes a long time. It takes a long time to build coalitions and, and get on the same page about bill tax. It's going to become law. Um, but oversight can be done right now. And it is being done right now. And what's cool is with crypto, it's being done in a bipartisan way, which is pretty unique. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, just t taking a step back and kind of looking at the facts, it's been hard for Congress to oversee the regulators right now uh, uh, because the Democrats have the majority. The regulators are Democrat nominated and confirmed. It just makes things a little trickier on their side. Um, I think when, uh, if you see Republicans take the majority, you see a shift in leadership come ne for next Congress. Uh, it, we're, we're going to then have the capabilities and the tools to subpoena information from the regulators to hold them accountable for how they're overseeing and for how they're 
collecting information from the crypto community um, and and, um, and 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 keep things on track in that way. Now, what does that mean for Gary Gensler, though? I mean, does that mean there's going to be some accountability, perhaps more on the congressional side from oversight? It means there will be a lot now? more accountability on the congressional side. Yeah, it's a priority for the committee um, when Republicans take back the majority. Digital assets are the first priority. Oversight is the second priority. Digital asset oversight is a huge priority. Um, so, so we'll be able to follow through on a lot of the seeds we've been planting this year, how they're collecting information from the crypto community um, and, and, and a lot of other things that we hear from you guys. So, um, so you know, we appreciate you guys coming to us with this stuff and, and always keeping things confidential. But uh, it is our responsibility to make sure that the rules of the road are being followed and, um, and that there's consistency with regulation so they, the community can innovate. Mm -hmm. And so we can protect consumers. You know, you know, there you go. So partisan politics, I mean, we don't want to get into that too much, but it is a fact, at least when it comes to elected officials on Capitol Hill. Is there anywhere where both parties agree on something in this space? Because it seems to be that the, the narrative around mining and the environmental side, it seems to be uh, you know, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party seems to be adamantly against it, and the Republican side seems to be embracing Bitcoin. Um, is there anything, is there any common ground, maybe is stable coins the common ground, or is there, is there other issues that we should be aware of? Yeah, I can, I can jump in on that one. Um, I think stable coins is exactly right. Um, we're seeing that um, as we're getting closer and closer on negotiations on the House side within the Financial Services Committee, but also beyond that, we um, have seen several pieces of legislation from the Senate as well that addresses stable coins, but in several other uh, parts of the ecosystem. Um, but I would say stable coins, first and foremost, given that uh, the significant amount of progress that is being made um, is not something that you see common around the Hill um, on digital assets or even other issues especially. Um, and so I think if we were to kind of list off uh, the most pressing needs that there is the most consensus on. Um, stable coins is definitely gonna be at the top of that list and I think we're gonna see a lot more movement um, and potentially even bills signed into law uh, late this year, early next year. And honestly, I'd say that there's more in common and that there's more common ground than not. Yes, mining is difficult for the environmental concerns. Central bank digital currencies are another issue of contention. Um, but overall, I think um, you know people are really motivated by the idea of this transition from Web 2 to Web 3, and individuals having more ownership over what they contribute to the economy. I think generally, like the concepts and the direction we're moving in um, has buy-in from both sides, and and you know some of the issues are more on the fringes, important, but. But you know, generally, um, there's a lot more consensus than you see. And legislation is hard to pass for reasons that, like you guys touched on, definitions, just agreeing on and building coalitions and education. Um, but but I see it less on like just general big picture direction. You mentioned uh, CBDCs. Um, I. I mean, I'm a little worried. I'm not convinced that they would serve any purpose that probably a current asset-backed stablecoin can't already do. Um, is that something that we should be worried about? Is there any future of a digital dollar anytime soon? I hope not. Um, I hope not. But, but I mean, look, that's what, that's what the Fed's studying. That's what the MIT uh, Digital Currency Initiative, that they're looking at retail-focused central bank digital currencies. So it's something that they're studying and exploring. The, exec the, crypt the Biden executive order on digital assets places the highest urgency on it. I will say in Congress, it is a non-starter. It's a non-starter, especially for Republicans. I think it's a non-starter for several Democrats. Um, and, and the biggest question is, what problem does it solve? There's not, there's uh, a lot of, uh, it's not very clear what, why, why we're doing this. Um, and I know it would be a big issue for my boss if we, uh, if we proceed with something like that. Uh, there's some rebuttals against it too. Sh share the same opinion on that. I mean, uh, not many of us are very convinced on, on, on the, the use cases of, of CBDCs and what they solve. Right? Our personal opinion is that the private market has already, you know, solved this problem and has issued a, a consumer product with stable coins that, that does everything a CBDC would do. I mean, I always look at China and look at the digital yuan and like see the worst case pot potential use case for something here. I mean, huge privacy concerns, huge financial freedom concerns. Um, it also like the government's not the greatest innovator. So why would we allow them to just like issue this? Um, there may be one merit for like interbank transfers and use cases, but from a consumer standpoint, I don't think it's necessary. And I think when you put it in the context of this is government controlled programmable money, uh, it, it really just kind of puts everything into perspective. Yeah. I'll, I'll pass, I'll just use cash. Yeah. <laughs> Before. 
I feel like to uh, both Lizzie and Francesca's point, I mean, we hear, especially when the conversation first started uh, about CBDCs, that because China's doing it, we have to do it faster, better, harder, stronger. And that shouldn't be the approach we take, uh, in my boss's opinion, and, um, because we, to Lizzie's point earlier, we it's not really clear what the benefits are here, but there are very clearly a lot of concerns and issues there that could um, arise from a CBDC, which it was also uh, very clearly evident in uh, the Fed's first paper that they put out and, and why they made it very clear that they don't have the authority to move forward on this on their own. Um, and we want to make sure that that, that continues. Earlier this year, the Biden administration released an executive order, and it was interesting because when that dropped, um, I, I, that week I probably got five different phone calls of friends of mine that are attorneys that have been watching the crypto space for years, but they said, I want in now, because it provided a sense of legitimacy, at least from the highest level in the White House. But besides the ex beyond the, the term executive order, what the heck is that? I mean, what, what is the point of it, and what is the action that's being taken to pursue this? Yeah, so for, the, uh, for those who may not remember, um, on March 9th of uh, this year, the Biden administration issued an executive order to study crypto on a number of fronts, you know, mining, use cases, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion, and many other fronts. Um, so all these agencies, you know, would be commerce, uh, treasury, uh, what have you, are studying the benefits of crypto, the uh, concerns you may have, and they're going to be releasing reports um, for the next couple of months uh, on, on this topic. And so there might be some findings that we may agree with, maybe some things we don't agree with as an industry. But here's the, the, you know, the biggest takeaway is that the Biden administration is really mirroring what the Clinton administration did with the internet back in the 90s. The idea of saying, this is legitimate, this is staying here, even though we all know here on this panel here that the US government was gonna try to ban crypto, uh, especially any time after the year, what, 2018 probably. Um, you know, there's still a need for regulation. I mean, that's why uh, Congress is hugely important here. And so, uh, at least the Biden administration, what they can do is they can come up with rules or recommendations for Congress uh, or the regulators to move on. Uh, and we think it's a good first step forward. And again, uh, we're still not, you know, fully endorsing because we don't know what's going to be in the, rep uh, the executive uh, order reports or stu uh, studies. But, you know, this is still a good positive step forward. And I think that, you know, as D.C. takes more attention to crypto, we should encourage that. And uh, especially as the United States led on Internet policy, I think we can lead on crypto policy. Uh, because if anyone looks around the world, we are definitely lagging compared to our uh, counterparts, unfortunately. Well, I know we're going to have some questions from the audience. I want to get, get to them. Um, and I have more, plenty of more questions to ask the panel. But I want to just get one in the rumor mill here. Um, one of the worst kept secrets in Washington is that uh, SEC Commissioner Gary Gensler has higher ambitions, perhaps, to be Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, I, I, is that going to happen? I mean, it, it was, if Yellen resigns after the midterms, you know, not all that uncommon, uh, is he a contender? These rumors have been going on for a while. I'll, I'll defer some of these other folks here if they've heard anything, but I've heard these rumors are not as substantiated. He's going to be sitting still where he's at for quite some time, um, which is great because I would love to have Lizzie's boss uh, or Francesco's boss and hopefully in the Senate, um, you know, grilling Gary Gensler down the road uh, in congressional hearings, uh, especially Lizzie's boss and Representative Ember is very tough on uh, Chair Gensler. So, um, so even if, you know, if the Treasury rumors aren't true, I think it's still good that if he's still at the SEC that we'll have good oversight from both sides of the aisle. Again, Lizzie uh, was highlighted, it's a bipartisan pushback against his approach to crypto. It's not just Republicans. Uh, do you want to talk about the blockchain eight letter you, you did to uh, uh, the SEC? Yeah. We did a letter um, to Gensler in March about, it was an oversight letter uh, requesting answers on, on about, I think, 12 or 13 different questions about how they collect information from the crypto community. Have they reviewed their process? Have they, um, you know, have they done a cost-benefit analysis? And a lot of very detailed questions. Um, his, his, he responded, but not to any of the questions. Um, and, and it was a bipartisan group of members, four members from the Republican side, four from the Democrat side. Three of the Democrats were on Financial Services Committee. And I think it was quite effective for that reason. I want to highlight again, there were four Democrats who went against their own party to say, hey, look, we are concerned with the Democrat administration on the SEC about how they're approaching crypto. That's really rare. That's really rare for someone to attack their own party uh, in politics. There's, just, there's a lot of tribalism here. I'm just saying, look, you know, we can't attack one of our own. So when folks, not just one member of Congress, but when four step out and say, we have concern with our own party and the direction they're taking, um, that's very concerning. Again, and one of the members of Congress on the Democrat side who uh, was on that letter was Richie Torres, who represents Brooklyn, right down over here. So it's really exciting to see uh, one of the most progressive members in uh, the U.S. House be very critical of this approach. Um, so it's really exciting to see uh, that, that bipartisan pushback. You got any questions from the audience? Yeah, we got one right over here.
The question was about crypto collateralized stable coins, like what Maker. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's that's important, right? Because that's where I get into uh, when when there's laws or legislation, different bills going out there. Each individual asset or each individual provision will have specific definitions. So it's Congress's job to to create a definition, and if it's like infrastructure for for brokers, way too broad, you unintentionally capture a whole host of other other assets and other providers, et cetera, into that. So this is something I think when I talked when we talked about education earlier that we need to be very careful about when crafting those definitions. It needs to be very clear, and this is where industry comes into, into, into play with educating members about the differences of all these different assets and how they operate. And when we're proposing definitions that we're very specific about that, because I feel like some of the stuff I've seen in terms of algos probably would capture collateral backed, which makes me nervous. Uh, so we want to be sure that we're very careful about how we define these things. And even then, once you define them, what are you doing with that definition? Um, but I mean, we are the, like <laughs> Congress and most of most of members and most of DC just like that has have not been actively engaged in this. I think just fi figured out what an algo was or like for the first time. So like if I think if we talked about what a collaterally backed stablecoin was, they'd be like, what like there's a third stablecoin? Like what is this? Um, and then we haven't even gotten into commodity backed stablecoins. <laughs> That's a whole other issue. So these are things that we need uh, to keep pushing on and keep the education up and make sure that uh, you know. Industry plays a good role to coming to us, coming to members, educating them on, on like the differences of, of between these different assets and, and, and what they do and how they operate and what the difference dis distinctions is. So when they are you know working on putting together or putting forth regulation or legislative proposals, that that is front and center of their mind when they're you know writing those definitions out and, and thinking about it. And I think a, uh, one of the policy points that's guiding a lot of the stablecoin discussions right now uh, for the stablecoin bills that are out there is the definition of high quality liquid assets and what that includes and should it include cryptocurrencies. Sorry. No, I think they both covered it well. I think uh, it's definitely on our radar um, and it's something that we're going to have to work through in the process as we're uh, working through the actual uh, legislation and individual uh, provisions in the text, but it's something that we want to make very clear that there is distinction there um, and no unintended co consequences on looping, uh, br uh, dropping in other assets that aren't um, part of the broader definitions. And one thing I want to highlight for everyone too is you know the importance of Congress taking the lead here rather than the regulators is that Congress is a lot more transparent of a process. You know when a bill gets introduced, you can see the bill text. Um, there, you know, there's ways to get uh, to amend it. There are multiple votes, you know, within committee, within the House, Senate. So there's multiple ways to change legislation. And again, we might not, not get the end result we want, but it's a lot more transparent of a process rather than going through uh, a regulator who says, like, this is what, you know, a stable coin is. You must follow these rules. Uh, you can submit comments, industry or other stakeholders, but we may or may not take it into consideration. So, uh, we, you know, we, we definitely prefer as an industry, uh, you know, not just for crypto, but just, just more broadly, it's a lot easier and more transparent to go through Congress rather than going through the regulators and, and crossing your fingers that they do it uh, right or they do it uh, correctly. So uh, th this is why, again, 2023 is going to be such a big deal because we're going to see bills, again, not just introduced, but moving this time. And so it's going to be really exciting. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. Great question. Right here, in front row. Here. So the question was, um, have you gotten any stakeholder uh, engagement, polling, uh, any test, any, is that kind of the question? Like what, what constituents, are you uh, getting any updates or feedback from them as you craft this policy? I'm happy to jump in on that one. Um, yeah, so I think, um, so you can go on behalf of my boss, that's one of the first questions he asks anytime we are drafting legislation, considering legislation, letters, things like that, is um, where is the industry on this? Where are individual members of uh, trade associations? Um, what's their perspective? Have we gotten any individual feedback from them? And so that's where um, great organizations like BA and their feedback um, on legislation that we consider is something that we put at the top of our list because at the end of the day, we want to promote policy um, that does promote innovation and protects consumers. Um, and so ultimately we wanna let um, the individual users and consumers drive what the right policy solutions are. So absolutely, definitely something that we consider at the uh, very significantly. 
I, I would agree with that too. Right? Each office operates a little bit differently in how they go about creating policy, but um, very similar in that approach. I mean, it's it's literally, I think, step you know, number one or two in our process. Number one is usually coming up with an idea, and then two is literally touching base with stakeholders in, in industry participants to be like, all right, one, does this, sol does this solve a problem? Does it cause more issues? Um, and what's your feedback so we can develop? And I mean, throughout the entire process for us, we are in constant contact with stakeholders, with participants, with industry, with literally just users, um, and understanding how this imp would implement in, in the real world test case and, and try and understand how to craft this so it has the most, uh, the most amount of impact and in a way that is beneficial, right? Because we don't wanna, like the, our, our job is not to just make policy for the sake of making policy. You do something because it's worth doing and you do it right. Otherwise, it's not worth doing at all. I think we're in a situation right now where um, the US is, is uh, probably, you know, you know, I look at Europe and what's going on with Mika and I <laughs> think, wow, okay, at least we're not, we're not going that direction. Um, we have an opportunity here to, to put forward some good, good clarity and good regulation frameworks that benefit if, if, uh, industry. And the one thing we hear from folks and from stakeholders all the time is we just want guidance. We just want to know what we can and can't do. I just want to know and have something that says X, Y, Z, so I don't have to hope that what I'm doing here, like that I'm going to get like a, an action letter from like Gensler or something. So and that's that's what goes into our Yeah, work. and I just add to that, I think the drive for like regulatory clarity on, in addition to every everything you guys mentioned is um, is is protecting uh, individual, you know, people who are using this stuff. Because every time that there's a shift in posture from one of the regulators, they come out, uh, you know, saying that X number of tokens are now a security. Like that screws over retail people. So, um, so, so the the drive for regulatory clarity, I think, comes from wanting to. Um, provide clear rules of the road so individual Americans can have confidence to engage um, with this technology. One last thing to, to build up, you mentioned, you know, the voter base or, you know, and constituents and stuff that the members of Congress listen to, you know, at least on the campaign trail, it's election season, members of Congress, for the most part, aren't going to go up to, you know, their local uh, community center and say, you know, crypto regulation is necessary, it's, it's not really a stump speech that gets really the voters excited, you know, they're talking about immigration, abortion, and a lot of more, you know, high level issues that are more pertinent on the social front. But I will also say that Twitter has been one of the most effective and sometimes ineffective tools uh, when it comes to policy. I mean, you, they all are laughing here because it's true, because Twitter can be one of the best things to uh, get exposure to the members of Congress or to legislation that's working on that, that a lot of these folks are, are spearheading on Capitol Hill. But at the same time, the vitriol that happens on Twitter for the most minor things can really get out of hand. And uh, I mean, it depends on, on the member of Congress, but a lot of members of Congress read their own tw Twitter uh, when they have some extra downtime. So uh, for those who are maybe not as engaged or familiar with the industry, they're going to see a, a, there's a lot of uh, hate sometimes on crypto Twitter, and that can be uh, detrimental. But you know, on the inverse side, it's been really positive to get a lot of good messages out there and to highlight a lot of the individual work that these guys are leading. So. Uh, and it's been also a good way for the industry to stay connected in real time, which has been something that's really rare and unique in policy, is just the, the real-time nature and the fast acting of, uh, of crypto Twitter uh, and how it reacts to policy. So it's been really exciting to see. Uh, but I hope the, it tampers down, at least, with the vitriol. On yeah, everybody up on here is on Twitter, so follow everybody up on stage today. Get some inside updates on a regular basis. And by the way, that's interesting, the point about constituents and just voters in general. I mean, it's just amazing to see how, uh, I guess, more mainstream the topic of crypto has happened over the last few years. You know, a few years ago, uh, these politicians, they probably wouldn't have touched the issue. Now it's more common than ever, and we need to elect more uh, pro-candidates on that topic. You right here? I'm curious, what's the government's uh, thoughts of uh, privacy and anonymity of crypto? Like, uh, is there any way that uh, uh, government would try to enforce KYC on DEXs or uh, like uh, ban even them because there is no uh, know your customer? And like, uh, also a question: Is there um, like, for example, when the tornado cache was banned, all the addresses was banned? Like, uh, is uh, does this ban work retrospectively for uh, people who use Tornado Cash before the ban? Like, are those addresses also affected and uh, kind of blacklisted? Yeah, I think I'll jump in with that. Um, on the on the KYC front, that's been a, a question uh, we've been trying to grapple with in terms of how do you 
look, at how do you apply, one, should you, and how do you apply KYC requirements within DeFi, and especially on DEXs? Because how it's traditionally applied, or it works in, in TradFi is, you know, you're a financial institution, you collect that consumer's, or that, that, that consumer's information, and that gets sent over to the proper uh, authorities, regulators. From a DeFi perspective, that's all peer to peer. If we're gonna enter into a transaction, do I have the right to collect your information and store that and send that out and vice versa? Like, I would argue there's a lot of concerns with that. There's a lot of privacy and data protection concerns. There's constitutional concerns. Um, so if we're, gonna, if we're gonna go down that route, we need to really thoughtfully think through, one, does it need to happen? And that can happen in a sense of, you know, if you're creating thresholds for something sufficiently decentralized, uh, whether those tra TradFi provisions and, and standards have to apply towards uh, a DEX uh, or any other ran uh, additional protocol. Uh, maybe they're different, maybe they were absolutely different. My, my opinion on this is, you know, this is a novel piece of technology. Why don't we create novel new ways to, to deal with it? Like, let's not just, a, you know, force uh, a, a, round, a square peg into a round hole kind of situation with traditional, uh, traditional uh, laws about how you regulate and enforce KYC and AML. Um, uh, now that's not to say that there isn't some sort of regime or re reporting requirement that you implement, but let's think about how it works. Let's look at the actual technology and how it interacts, how smart contracts work, and look into and, and, and about using the actual fundamental mechanism to enforce maybe a different way of, of thinking about how, how we traditionally collect this information. Because, I mean, that's, it's kind of scary to think that like anybody would have to collect this information and deal with it. Like that's a, like would that be a felony if you don't report, right? That, that's a whole issue. Um, and then on the tornado cash issue, man, that, wow. That was some crazy news that dropped. Um, I think regardless of your opinion on it, the fact that you have uh, the government coming out and essentially blocking a, a tool not, not an individual, not a group of, of, uh, of actors, but a tool that was unfortunately being used by, for illicit use by a bunch of actors and blacklisting it um, has some grave concerns. Uh, I think Coin Center has done a lot of good stuff on this recently. They put out a lot of good talks and, and, and thinking on it. Uh, and it goes back to a comment I made earlier about freedom of speech, right? Like, you know, we were seeing code being removed from GitHub related to that. Like, that's problematic. Like, this is the US. We don't ban freedom of speech. Did you want to answer that one real fast, though, Lizzie? Well, yeah, just to put out real quickly on the, on the um, OFAC sanctioning point, there's a lot of outstanding questions because this, is, this seems just different from how, you know, the traditional process and, you know, has worked before. And with that, um, what would help us help you guys um, is to better understand what those outstanding questions that you guys have, what does this mean for, you know, the people who are receiving uh, funds through Tornado Cash uh, unwillingly, involuntarily, what does this mean for, X, Y, and Z. Those would be good questions for us to understand. Um, so, so we welcome it all. Thank you. All right, we have one more question from you right there. Thanks so much. I'm just going back to um, a comment that was made earlier about how technology and crypto really isn't a partisan issue. But, you know, from my understanding, what we're hearing from today, the panelists, you know, you all work for Republican Party members. And it seems like a lot of the support that we hear on the Hill comes from Republican Party members in a lot of Republican cities throughout the US. It's just spade a spade. So I guess my question is, when we look at more progressive members, both in the Senate and um, in the House of Representatives, and even in the Democratic Party, what do you think the disconnect is with crypto and not seeing their values reflected in what I happen to think, and probably a lot of people here, could be a really transformative space. Uh, I can touch on that for a little bit, and then, I mean, Lizzie, feel free to wait into well, anyone else as well, since she has deal with these colleagues all the time. But at least on the Democrat side, I mean, the, it's the same ideologies, but sometimes it's just the way you, you present the, the, the issue. So Republicans, at least in, in my conversations, a lot more, uh, you know, job creation, wealth creation, as well as um, you know, just the new form of finance here, which is really exciting for them. Uh, on the Democrat side, though, it's more about the healthy unbanked, the inclusion elements here, and that's been really resonating with a lot of the younger members here who have seen, look, the, the banks have failed in this, uh, you know, several times, and this is a new technology that can really bridge that gap that we haven't seen before. 
Um, and so that's why we've seen, again, it's more of a generational issue where a lot of the younger members of Congress are a lot more open to new ideas uh, and saying, look, it may have been done this way for 50 plus years, doesn't mean it always has to be done that way. Um, whereas those who are older and more set in their ways, more set in under their understanding, um, it's, it's really daunting to get involved in this issue. And I think that's why, uh, at least in the, the Democrat side, a, a lot of them do look to the, the more uh, senior older members, and those are the ones who kind of set the tone for everything else down the road. And those more senior older members just, quite frankly, aren't really pro-crypto. Those are the, the Elizabeth Warrens of the world. Uh, whereas, again, I mentioned Richie Torres, who represents Brooklyn, is one of the most progressive uh, uh, members in the House side, and he's all in. And he's actually wrote a whole op-ed about the progressive case for crypto uh, that he's been sharing around with all of his colleagues on Capitol Hill, which is exciting. Um, so I think, you know, again, I think we're, we're seeing more and more shift here, uh, and, and candidly, too, talking about politics here, the Republicans aren't the ones in power, so they can talk a lot more and be a lot more free with what their thoughts are, whereas the Democrats are having a lot more on message in terms of, uh, you know, supporting the party's ideologies, and crypto just isn't as high up on that list 